should I start? Thank you. Ayushi, can we start? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. We are pleased to welcome you all for the third edition of Straight Talk series organized by the Faculty of Architecture at CEPT. This series invites speakers who are engaged with particular aspects of architectural design and production in their practice to throw light on the topics that are central to the profession but are less discussed and theorized within academia. This series is scheduled from 15th March to 19th March, and the thematic focus for the series this year is architectural detailing. Today, we are on the third day of the series, which would be delivered by architect Somitra Ghosh. He joined as a partner in Matthew and Ghosh Architects, a partnership founded by Nisha Matthew Ghosh in 1995. The work done by him is varied across the spectrum and ranges from projects or ideas to do within urban research, space, architecture, interiors, and product design. He has worked with Dean Projects before forming his multi-directional collaborative practice. Having taught in different schools of architecture and at Bengal Institute, Dhaka, has been Charles, Charles Korea design chair, juror, panelist at numerous occasions and forums. He was lucky to begin his journey of teaching with Kumar Vyas, founding member of NID. He has interest in teaching since graduation. Anish, I think you got muted. Yeah. So should I start from start? Okay. Hello. Yeah, yeah, continue Anish. <laughs> Okay, he has interest in teaching since graduation, especially architectural design. His personal interests are politics, philosophy, culture, and history to understand the world we live within and work within. His today's lecture would be focused on the topic of detailed stories. This lecture would be followed with a question and answer round. Kindly post your questions in the chat box. I would like to now pass the spotlight to our speaker. Thank you, Anish, for um, the introduction. Thank you, Sankalp, for the opportunity. And it's wonderful to be speaking to, uh, especially to students from my own school. So it's a pleasure. I'll start with my talk. Um, <clears throat> and I really look forward to um, questions that you may have. Are you able to see the screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, done. Great, welcome everyone, uh, we'll start. So some of the questions which, uh, um, which often arise, uh, or at least some of the words uh, uh, which guide us when we think about details and um, there's an interesting anecdote uh, which Prem Chandavarkar talks about, which is um, that when he had finished his master's uh, a, a program in, in America and uh, he wanted to join an office and uh, the, uh, the, the interview asked him whether what uh, position interests him most and obviously he said design. So, um, so I think the interviewer chuckled because he was quite familiar with the answer. And I think quite often we have um, imagined, uh, we have imagined that uh, the process of design, uh, which, which is at the beginning of the project is, is uh, perhaps the most interesting part, which obviously it is, but I think the, the process continues uh, to remain interesting throughout the project. Um, 
because it's it's uh, it's a path of constant negotiation and reality descending um, um, and when i say descending perhaps i should use the word ascending uh, because i see it positively um, <clears throat> so these are some of the words which is which could uh, which could open up the discussion and i will take you through a few projects which um, can raise some questions um, which might already be bothering you. Um, purpose, material, technique. So I think as we go along, we'll be touching on this. So I'm not going to repeat those. Um, uh, working with an old building, uh, always a challenge um, because it's it's like getting the sense of, of an alien body, which is much older. Um, perhaps in very poor state uh, of disrepair and uh, cracks and failures. Um, so how does one, so there is one aspect which is uh, a very important one, which is about how does one work with a structure like this um, and yet be an architect um, and yet bring the building back to shape uh, is it only about conservation or preservation, or is it is it about or is there some creative space still within possible? So um, this was uh, this was a eighteen nineties uh, orphanage after in Bangalore. It is um, and it was a, a boys orphanage, and uh, the boys left after the after they grew up. They were educated here by a trust. And since then, it was briefly used uh, as an underprivileged school extension. And otherwise, it was generally sort of falling apart. Um, almost literally, because certain walls had developed severe uh, cracks and stresses. And you could see the roots coming from the ceiling to the, to the floor. Uh, prominently, and of course, certain modifications which had been made. Um, surprisingly, even the wall, uh, which you see on the left, uh, we realized that there were parts where uh, there was there were two single brick walls running parallel to each other, where the roots had gotten in, and because of cracks in the in the roof. Uh, water had gotten in and of course this was mud mortar with lime plaster so the mud, mud mortar sort of accepted the roots to grow inside within the walls and the roots would gradually thicken and they would split the walls and as th that would happen um, the mud mortar would also sag so the uh, roof would come down further and it would get more cracks almost a cyclic process um, the path, of course, uh, begins to understand the building uh, because before intervening with any kind of details, one has to think uh, as to what it is um, and studying it for all its um, all its aches and pains, uh, whether it's settlement cracks, whether it's um, deterioration of the wooden beams, purlins, um, or whether it's uh, the waterproofing and, and more importantly, the position of the water outlets, which is uh, adding to the grief and the slopes. So we decided to um, primarily just remove what, which, what seemed to have been only alterations um, uh, for certain purposes. And if you see on the right, there are some tiny dots, um, which are circular steel columns, which would be inserted. So the strategy was to be practically invisible in position um, with respect to the building and um, respect its uh, idea of symmetry uh, at most places, which is evident. Also, um, putting back uh, all, all the material, literally like the flooring, which was uh, peeling off from the ground to uh, take it off and bring it back again. So most places it is 
almost an invisible hand, which uh, was the plan. So what you see here uh, in the red lines is uh, are steel pipes, which would have a kind of a fork at the top. So they would hold the beams so that in case of a crack, they would get arrested by these uh, uh, pillars, which would have independent foundations and uh, not be dependent on the wall if it has a uh, slight settlement. So after, of course, correcting all the settlement issues uh, by taking care of uh, under the foundations at the four corners of the building where it was falling apart, uh, because of water taking away grains of sand from the foundations, uh, rainwater. And um, so this, these props were added. Uh, most of the beams were, uh, what you see in green are the places where we could uh, get away with just having steel caps uh, uh, for the uh, kind of rotting ends of the purlins and not change everything and would only change a few beams uh, as as and where required. So this is the system which uh, sort of brought it back to uh, good life. Uh, so if you look at uh, the section, um, and if you were to um, look at this particular point where the roof dips, that was actually the the major uh, problematic area because. Uh, it was really sinking over there. Um, so the challenge here was how to make it symmetrical from inside and outside, uh, which you will. Uh, so this is an observation as you as you see the steel steel, uh, the thin galvanized sheet outlet pipes were actually the original ones. And as you can see in the picture on the right, that they have actually disappeared within the uh, rain waterproofing and a new cement pipe was inserted. So they had put because there must have been leakage because there were trees around and they were blocking the uh, outlets so they must have just patched it up and put another layer which made the roof very heavy especially on a wooden framed uh, ceiling with a, a madras terrace roof so obviously it had almost one and a half feet of uh, weight on it dead weight so how to work out uh, a symmetry which uh, so there was a requirement of a beam here and since the windows were here so there are four columns on which are marked as a and two columns at b but they are actually in different lines so this was is very interesting because it's across the wall so you actually uh, cannot see it's like a cinema camera which moves from outside to the inside of the house and moves between the rooms almost like that. So uh, we started with sketches. Uh, uh, and this project was largely driven by uh, by sketches. And if you see that the beam, the beam is here, which is supporting uh, where the word section is written. And of course, waterproofing details and other things. These are working drawings, which were used for site. Um, and um, yeah, details which were worked out uh, and of course further instructed on site. So this is how it works, that you can actually get a connection between the four columns outside and the two columns inside through the beam. You use the beam as, as the transfer uh, member. So from outside you see that and what you see inside is in another line. The small details, I think the other thing which matters is uh, since it was rather critical for this place to have an ambience for which it was actually taken on lease the, uh, as a design store, um, that any new details uh, should have, should be sympathetic to the past. Uh, so we devised this kind of gate and a transfer of level, which is, this is, I'm very really fond of this detail where there is a transfer of level with a separate material, which is a stone block and how the skirting um, is the one which mediates
from a higher level uh, to the lower level. Of course, it has come back to life, but you never change the layers of uh, its existence over the ages. So you just leave the patina of most of the things uh, existing. Um, so the grandmother and the grandfather still look their age and not uh, otherwise, and yet they have received treatment and the courtyard has come back to life. It has a lovely cafe here now and an art space which is surrounding which is utilized. It has had book readings by well-known people over here. I move to a. I'll keep moving from different projects. Uh, uh, a structure on uh, a, a structure of four stories, where two stories were in concrete and the upper two, upper two stories were in steel. Um, so two houses below with RCC frame and one house on top with a steel frame. How the roof expands outside. So this is actually all about the idea of screen and. What is the logic? And um, because this was the first time for me to uh, work out, work with a glass uh, reinforced concrete screen, uh, which can be quite heavy, uh, almost 60, 70 kg uh, for its size. How the columns and the beams would uh, attach to uh, attach to each other, uh, made up I section uh, I beams and a star column. Uh, so the framework of the skin or the screen on the right attaches itself in this manner to the structure. And this was the intent. The intent was to actually make it feel as if it was, <clears throat> it was a screen to create privacy for the house and get a dapple light on the inside. This is during the construction um, from the outside. So these, these are actually held on a uh, mild steel epoxy uh, painted uh, frame with stainless steel beadings, uh, which you will see gradually. So, uh, so this was <coughs> the second floor of the house, which would uh, completely make a private world with a garden and a swimming pool on the second floor at the back and the entire living space just left open throughout the day and night, uh, almost feeling as if you're in the middle of a jungle, which is not true, this is right in the heart of the city. Uh, so the, in, the trees actually, which are looking like uh, a forest at the back, they're actually the neighbor's trees because the other houses are just about ground plus one or ground plus two. And there's no dining inside, it's just a, so this, the details are, it's just a deck sheet. Uh, so it's more the detail of the screen and how, so it was uh, quite interesting uh, because one had to have a single module of the screen so that there are no two molds to be made. Uh, so one could repeat it. So one had to deal with that and one had to deal with different profiles of stainless steel beading. Uh, for different conditions, whether it's a corner, whether it's a middle, whether it's uh, so, and that <clears throat> to optimize it to minimum num kinds of sections. So they were basically bent steel uh, sheets. So this is just a framing. I'm not going to uh, hold on to this. Uh, the screen does have certain openings. So how it would attach to the, to the beams and to the structure behind. And it actually began like this. It, it actually began, began with uh, trying to understand the fixing of the frame to the concrete, uh, also to understand the beading, which you see at the bottom left. You can see a U-shaped uh, beading. Then you see a beading, which is L-shaped, which is uh, in section one. So one was actually trying to get a hold of how one could, uh, what would be the sequence of uh, work um, and which would be and how one would go about installing it uh, because safety being a big aspect. Uh, on top there was a glass so um, to avoid being dependent only on sealants um, uh, the preference is always to have a proper gasket uh, uh, when when joining two pieces of glass. Um, 
so that's what um, so i'm just going to go a bit fast on this because it's uh, it's just the idea which i wanted to convey how to hold the screen and then of course the exact millimeters of uh, dimensions uh, which would come into play what kind of uh, stainless steel um, um, uh, bolts would be used so pretty much there was there was three kinds of uh, profiles and this was of course designed um, and then the mold was checked and then of course it was converted into drawings uh, which were more precise in proportion and that's what it appears like then came a project which was very similar but here the risk was extremely high because uh, the pool was inside the house uh, so there was three stories of volume and actually there was the screen was hanging at the top as well so that you would get uh, moonlight in this pool, uh, beautiful moonlight coming in uh, at night when you swim. Um, so that was the mold. And my fear was uh, even if one had strengthened the frame, the beading, it could actually be the panel which could collapse by its self weight by um, sagging from the middle because it's, it's a kind of organic shape which we had given. So we did a very simple test uh, of loading um, gradually and uh, observing and then you see on the right uh, till what point it uh, really gave way so it was quite uh, I mean it was heartening that it's uh, almost impossible to collapse uh, by its own self weight so I think we had put about um about 150 to 200 kg uh, on the panel of course details uh, have to be precisely worked out so that water doesn't get in from corners whether it's um, facing upwards whether it's facing sidewards uh, and how profiles uh, um also, uh, what you see on the top above the steel section uh, on the right is a place where one could walk because there was a glass above the screen so that one could actually go there and um, clean the glass off. So it was a contained volume. So uh, one could clean the glass uh, from top while having a proper passage to walk. And of course, trying to ventilate it. So these are um, um, to see that it is naturally ventilated. Just just a turbo vent which sort of pulls up the air from air and the dampness. So you can see the screen at the top, how it is suspended from a frame, and of course the facade as well. Uh, This is a project which uh, of actually two identical twins. The building on the left looked exactly the way the one on the right looks. Uh, one floor was added on top and the rest of the changes were inside. And there was a connection which was made, which was made across the two buildings. Um, <clears throat> so the left side building was about keeping the old shell and working within that, because I think there were two challenges. One is that there was not enough natural light. And second, a little need for a war room, which is for clients, uh, <clears throat> foreign designers who would come and buy fabrics uh, from here, which is designed by this uh, design studio called Zanab Home Studio. Um, really brilliant work in linens and um, cotton and silk. Um, so this is what we did. Uh, we opened up the building, removed the slabs, uh, kept the bones uh, intact, added a new set of bones, which are far more slender, sometimes attached to the old system. 
removed all the walls on the periphery so that we could bring in light to the center of the building, we could bring it to the periphery of the building. The second challenge was always and is always for anybody who works with a lot of uh, natural fabrics and uh, dyes uh, is that distortion of color uh, through the entire day should be minimized uh, when uh, perceiving the color. So it, everything had to be almost a neutral gray. So that shows uh, what had been removed and what has been added. And you get a sense of a structure which has been added, which is like a loop, which relies on the central beam. So the slab has been removed from here and here. And the light goes down to the ground floor because this is glass and you can walk over this glass. And all the walls have been removed. Um, so you get complete light and you also get ventilation, which you will see uh, later. So that's all the cutouts and uh, one is introducing a secondary um, alternate structure uh, and combining it so that uh, they can um, add to each other's strength. So that's the middle space. The roofs do not touch. The glass is actually resting, um, is independent on one side so that it can expand and contract. Um, but protect the central space because that's where most of the goods move. And how the skeleton is an architecture of its own architecture and the, and the bare concrete beams, which are existing from the past, um, show up. So you can easily see that there is, this was one floor, the roof was here and the second roof was here. But now you have three levels within two levels. So all these slabs were removed and we now have three levels and enormous amount of light that you can see over here. So all details practically beginning from uh, analog sketches uh, in the sketchbook. My apologies. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. Is the screen shared? Not yet. Okay. Yeah, we can see now. Right. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah. So the light uh, penetrates through the through the building, passes through to the center of the building because all the checking of the fabrics happens there. So if you look at the details, how uh, it attaches to the slab over here, um, and this kind of connector which sort of ties up the structure on two sides, what suspends a staircase um, over here. So it, uh, perhaps these are opportunities uh, which arise uh, from where you locate these things and 
and that's what makes them special. So details perhaps don't need to be imagined with a certain level of perfection or or or, or a kind of aspiration, but uh, perhaps utilizing opportunities which come by. Um, if you look at the skin, all the the entire uh, these were all closed with ordinary windows. Uh, those are looms where they do their uh, uh, um, uh, pro, uh, you know um, small samples uh, before they're sent out to factories for manufacture. Uh, so this skin is a very light skin because it's made of folded uh, mild steel uh, uh, sheet. Uh, instead of eye sections or uh, heavier sections. And then it is filled with insulation. And then there's, this is a bison panel, which uh, envelops it. So the light traverses through the building. And I think that's a very beautiful thing because you can literally recognize which time of the day it is by the movement of the sun. Um, and these are details which um, which were, of course, first sketched so that uh, they could be then articulated, also discussed with the consultants. And how the light comes from the top, because that is glazed, so you get direct sunlight and you get ventilation. And even the floor is opened up over here so that it can breathe right through and through. So this is how the... Uh, the panel was devised, so the the rock which was put inside was is actually held by springs which we normally use uh, for uh, um, for sofas um, so one could actually you know um, use that so so that it does not sag over time so these are simple arrangements it was later done in both directions so that it would have a better grid of support and a certain flexibility because steel uh, with the temperature variation will move. So that movement should not create uh, uh, a kind of, a, uh, that flexibility is necessary. So the space becomes very simple. It reminds me very much of the 60s and 70s uh, East European structures. This was a simple building which my uh, which the owner had rented and finally ended up buying. Uh, but and that's perhaps something about such generic structures that they are so accepting. They are so accepting of uh, anything. So that's the central portion where the light comes. And left side is the war room, and the right side is the terrace. So it's made with an insulated double galvanized sheet roof. Um, so you also get ventilation from under this area, uh, from these slight funnels which are created, and skylights which bring in light and take it for two floors down. When we detail and we always imagine the, the pristineness to remain, and um, and if one looks at the steps on the left, and this is an observation my uh, my friend and client made, that he said that I love this the way it has worn out. Uh, um, it was just painted, um, and it has worn out. So he, I think the beauty of it is it shows that it is used and what we leave behind when we walk shall remain. Um, so I think that's a, I think it's quite a beautiful thing instead of just the pristineness of, and this is the next building, which, which is yet to be done. And it has become um, a great place for, uh, we have opened up certain things. So it's literally like an exhibition space and we are hoping to exhibit there um, sometime soon for ourselves. Um, of our work and um, it has been used as a space um, by Phantom Hands, wonderful furniture they do and uh, it was shot here and Jaipur Rug did a, a shoot here uh, last week. Yeah, so buildings become such, uh, you know, in, in their 
state of rawness uh, and the lack of detail and uncertainty of its future, it is um, so open for anything uh, that can wants to inhabit it. Next project, a tiny school, only one classroom, um, but it's about a tiny detail, which I want to talk about. The structure is very simple, four columns. So instead of making a classroom, which was sitting in the open space, we just made a plinth, which is interesting so that the children can start using the place better. Uh, lovely trees are already there. The classroom is lifted up and uh, a, a light roof is put on top. So the idea is that one gets a, a semi-covered space for parent-teacher meetings, for the students to sit where um, when they are, it's time to leave, to be picked up, uh, to come in and have their uh, gathering uh, and play around, of course. It has completely changed uh, how uh, they use this uh, the space. So this is the little detail. This, of course, I mean, uh, I myself would, uh, um, may not have looked at it at the time when I designed it, but of course it has certain alto influences, obviously. Um, it was actually to soften um, in case the children while playing around and running around would bump into it. Um, so it was made of um, five pieces of wood so that you fix uh, fix them and then you get away protected uh, till a certain, uh, you know, the column is, um, it doesn't hurt anymore. So this is only about the place and space. Uh, so these little details, uh, they matter because they are the ones which, which they touch and run around in circles. And um, um, it, this is um, uh, 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 the largest microbrewery in Asia, which is in Bangalore. Um, um, looks very derelict. It's not an old building. It's it's a new building, so it's it's uh, it's of course a very different kind of challenge uh, for detailing um, itself uh, with old materials. Worked with a conservation contractor. Um, uh, humongous in scale. Um, so what could it do? I mean, um, um, so there is, there are elements from different times. So the history of technology, I think, what one is trying, actually attempting to do is not only at a, as a larger concept, that it is actually trying to bridge time and place um, as a kind of oasis for a very highly uh, skilled migrant population. Uh, we are familiar only with the word of, uh, of migrants as unskilled labor, but in Bangalore, it is um, IT. The IT crowd is fairly, uh, you know, well dated, and um, they have come here to work, um, and they are skilled. So it's an oasis for for them. Um, it crosses um, boundaries of time and place, and when one does does that, then we are also looking at the history of technology, which is the jack arch. Um, with steel beams um, or with the aesthetic of, of these frames, which are um, inspired from the palace of Mysore. So it's also trying to localize it a bit um, in some ways. So it's trying to make a very wide sweep of warmth um, in, in, the, in the place. Um, large terraces, where performances happen and the club, which is like a giant barn um, with the bar uh, on the upper level, which goes up like a church organ um, and the railing inspired from the Bali uh, structure of the plant. So it's, it's also about playing at different scales uh, and, and the material. This is ordinary galvanized sheet. It is completely acoustically treated. <coughs> Sorry. It has insulation, um, can be long, um, closed up. So how does one build this? Uh, so this reflective uh, mirror 
which has been placed uh, inside the bar is because you will see in the early picture that it's all reflecting the picture on the right. So there are tiny lights hidden and just a frame and golden mirror. So little things of opulence because the whole idea was a kind of celebration slightly over the top so that uh, it would be attractive and how a simple railing like this inspired from uh, a plant can actually bring character to, and of course, the detailing of how it would be done and how the place gets used uh, by a very large number of people. This is a house which Nisha has uh, exclusively designed and I sort of took it to completion. So one, the one in the middle is the plan. And this house is for an architect, um, uh, a wonderful client and a wonderful person. Um, the idea was, about a passage and not revealing everything up front and giving each space uh, its own views which are special and their own. Um, so it was about, the passage was about moving, it was about light, it was about change of space. And here comes, of course, this has been perhaps the most well-detailed project so far. I think the second one is happening now, again, for the same client, you'll see a glimpse of it. Um, but yeah, the most challenging to get it done. Um, so, um, because the walls are sort of twisted and uh, and this uh, the contractor had never done um, exposed uh, form finished concrete. So we were looking at, finding a method of, uh, you know, um, how one could define a position of a point in space uh, and give um, specific values. Um, so, so these were working drawings actually. So that this was a different way of conveying, we thought this would, which actually was successful, that we will be able to convey exactly what, so that they can actually construct. Because the inner walls are twisted, they are uh, inclined as well. So, so this was a method of establishing the X, Y, and Z. Uh, now, all the shuttering patterns, yes, in uh, with real surface, true surface, um, quite challenging to. Uh, but of course, a lot of learning. The idea of collecting water and the gargoyle, uh, which would be collected and then recycled it to feed the garden. Um, covered with zinc, um, you see that. Um, um, it's an extension, um, it's hand um, folded crimped zinc, um, completely watertight. So only the gutter and the copings are made for that. And these little roofs which are appendages to the building. The door, which is about two floors tall, which has a mechanical, you know, you can open the louvers with a, uh, you can pull it and yeah, it is, and it has, you can open the upper part with louvers, you can open the whole thing or you can open the guillotine um, like door so that the guests are entering only at their own risk. And all trials, uh, designing all the hardware uh, for such things. The steel frame and then um, the louvers are being put there. All hardware had to be designed. The staircase, which is, uh, which is literally suspended. Uh, it rests at the bottom. It has uh, little attachments to the wall and then it is suspended from either the wall or the roof. So it has uh, a fixing, it, it sits on the ground, fixes it a few places, then it suspend, it attaches to the wall here, it attaches to the wall here, and it gets a suspension over here and a little resting point over there. So it's like a fluid, like a rope, which you're trying to hold. Um, in the process, how it was done. And you, on the right, you can see that uh, there are pipes which are every three steps, which are going between 
the one side stringer to this side and the other ones are just small stubs of rod. I love doing um, light fittings. These are one of, this got the L Decor Award, um, a stainless steel light, uh, what I call as a sex duplets, six pieces suspended stainless steel, very small section. Uh, this is how we were doing the trial of suspending it. And that's the bar which has been made below and the suspended uh, light. Little details, almost like making a watch. Um, no, I think it's this is much more cruder than a watch. Um, but still, I think it's it's a good scale to get into. Uh, yeah. Um, Peter Richard comes, so we have a lovely time there. Um, yeah, that's that's the most happy place around this concrete bar which sits in the middle of the living room. Uh, not middle, it's 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 actually the place that you see when you come out of the passage and the bench on which um, uh, Peter and Usha are sitting uh, is also something that has been designed with a steel plate, which you see here. And it has a gentle incline. So what it does is that it makes you lean your arms on the, on the bar top. So I think that's something, this little thing makes such a difference that uh, I don't feel that I'm disconnected because constantly I want to feel the top of the bar and a little dovetail kind of joints um, with steel plates. And that's how it looks. Uh, and that's how it's made. Um, and of course the concrete bar when it was under construction. Uh, so it holds the fridge and it, it keep your drinks and the glasses and those things are all inside. Uh, the skirting is, is a very interesting piece because it's actually clad in zinc so that the walls look as if they are going right to the floor. And uh, uh, it's very easy to just push the dust to the groove and just take it out with a brush uh, or a brush vacuum cleaner. The coping's made in metal, especially, um, so that there is absolutely no chance, even if there is a crack and a separation. So it's about layering of plywood, a wedge of wood, uh, putting um, small clips uh, of aluminum and then putting uh, coping and putting the edges rolled over so the it would always drop the water away from a point where it can get in. Um, yeah, this, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a good picture of this, but this is a beautiful detail of, uh, they did not want curtains. So these are actually four folding shutters so that I could shut it and they would not get any light. So they overlap over the wall. So this is the hardware uh, for the hinges, but there is designed hardware, which is at the top and bottom. Uh, so these are some pictures, which I will go sort of quick and um, perhaps point out to the coping here. Um, the door on the left, the gargoyle on the right. In the middle, you see the collection of the rainwater from the gargoyle and the beautiful profile of, of this almost bird-like uh, water flow to the gargoyle. And the space is very dramatic. These are not uh, picture distortions. The space is like this. So um, the light really flows. Um, it's it's uh, Sometimes it feels as if you're staying in a cave. Sometimes it feels as if you are... Uh, actually outside, but you're just sitting under some kind of protection. So I think that kind of uh, is, is an interest. This, of course, I, I didn't show this. That's again, a light, a large light, almost eight feet long, um, made a perforated sheet, which I did uh, for the dining space, which you see on the left picture. So it just feels like a veranda. I think, I think that's its beauty and the roughness. And, uh, you know, the incidence of imperfections is, is just like life. Uh, so perhaps that's another way to think about details and surface uh, and material. Um, that what gets lent to it in the process actually becomes uh, um, 
its character. Um, you see that's a very large volume and just open um, a sort of reduced volume under uh, Ram study, which is upstairs. So that that's a cozy uh, place to watch the TV. And the most important space because uh, Usha is a writer, um, a very good writer, and she uh, sits at this place, looks at her garden, uh, and that's where she works from, which is part of the bedroom, and yet it feels like a log cabin. Again, the, the tiny detail of the edge of the wood, which is so slim, um, almost absent, uh, with just a groove separating the plaster. Um, so little things um, is really um, a, a, a little window like this, which is for her granddaughter, and she loves this place because it's it's so cozy. It's it's very uh, is just a good size till she gets into her teens. Um, so she has a window right next to her, and is on the first floor. She can open it, and there's a tree right outside. So it's also about the scale when we talk about details and um, I love this picture on the left that's her mother um, um, who sits there mo most of the mornings um, in the garden in the veranda and looking out a house which is going on right now um, yeah this was a bare shell uh, when the cantilever started to appear um, it's it's uh, it has two three small details. If you see the profile, which is the first time I'm trying this, uh, this has got a special detail for the entire rim of the window, as well as how the lime plaster covers it. That's the space that you get in the living in the living room. Seamless. This is lime plaster. It's not going to be painted. It's just seamless, um, uh, and it's not concrete. It's a it's a um, it, it's a uh, frame uh, roof. So fairly complex, but durability is of prime importance, especially in a place which is a weekend home, um, and open to the this being in Konor. Uh, and on um, close to the on the hills, the draft of the uh, rain is very strong. Um, so one has to be very particular. The door and the handle. When we talk about a handle, that's something we touch. And I think that's what you see. Uh, I'm not able to enlarge, but the little thing of how it has a soft uh, round edge and it has a bend to hold, which is the profile on what you hold over here. So it's about that. The second is about, so this is a door in a door. The idea is uh, uh, to be able to open this, um, uh, which you see on the right, so that if somebody comes and wants to drop a, you know, mail or something, so the whole day this can be kept open in the living room, uh, other than the windows, because that's the main door. So uh, and anybody has to keep the newspaper or whatever, it can be kept here. So this is in uh, still being done. Actually, the aluminum is being covered with uh, uh, a tape so that it doesn't get damaged. You see the door. Uh, details of gutters, uh, edges, hiding the screen. Uh, to for protection against the sun, um, continuity of uh, surface of the lime plaster on the inside. Um, it's it it's quite a it's, it's the it's extremely it's almost like um, it's like meditation you know that you do uh, with these um, details. Um, and how beautifully this is! These are all handmade roofs. These are not industrial sheets. Um, so that's actually the house is all about two blocks. It's about the living space and it's about the bedroom space and a view which is to the outside. It's at the foothill of a, of a, um, of a kind of, uh, of a tea garden. 
Uh, yeah, again, lights have appeared. This is, this is the bison light, which I'm doing. Uh, uh, with all its details, it's being made with wood and perforated aluminum. And that, of course, becomes my headgear too. Uh, so hope to see that in uh, a little time. I will close with the last project, which is uh, the National Military Memorial, which hopefully will be opening this year. Um, after uh, to have a public opening. So it was, again, the geometry was fairly complex because we were actually operating between trees and their roots. Um, so the drums were formed uh, and one was coming down and then going six meters into the ground and then traversing to the top and then coming out. So it was, it was like a ritual path which uh, one would traverse. So this has become a very popular place uh, because it has large amphitheater-like steps, but it's actually about the ramp, the passage, and a place to rest. And it is being, because it's underground, the green is consuming the walls. And I'm really hoping that it will be so consumed that it will not be visible anymore as a building with walls, but rather a kind of a green, um, uh, a kind of, path in the green below. These are courtyards and their uh, geometries and how one sort of anchors these down and also um, one has to make weep holes. Um, so one is looking, at, and of course, uh, working out in complex geometries uh, with fixed width stone available and getting the perfect slope for walking. Um, very interesting. Um, uh, the name plaques with the uh, martyr's names. Um, granite on top with the names and uh, white marble uh, at the bottom. Of course, skylights and other things which you will see um, in the pictures which follow. So that's that's the kind of plan um, and the six meters down through the ramp and the steps and the courtyard which is these are older pictures now it's all consumed by green so very happy that it's uh, really taking over the building the interior space the paint black was a suggestion because though she had visited when it was i think the structure was not closed yet with glass, but structure was done. And, um, and I, he said that let the roof just uh, gradually vanish and the blackness will, will go away, you know, will take it away and seem endless, which I thought was a wonderful idea. So I'm grateful that he had come at that time. Um, this, is this, uh, this is the large stone here. Actually, it's all about man and machine and process and I have never seen such a uh, meticulously worked out shifting. This is the memorial stone, 450 tons, single piece, which you can see on the right, loaded onto the truck, or getting loaded on the truck with a truck with 240 wheels, <coughs> pulled by four trucks simultaneously. Um, the level of coordination that one has to do to shift from top left when it is coming out of the quarry. So it needs four trucks to pull against the slope. And then once it is out, then it can traverse uh, on the road. It cannot go over any bridges. And that's when it was being pulled out. And the feeling of absence after it has left and the people who were behind it. So we have to remember that um, there is a, other than the architect who do the design and the details and there is a large number of people whose memories are attached to these projects. And we need to remember them. Um, it's, it's a very significant part of uh, their uh, life. 
and memories. Um, you see the process of lifting the stone, um, of sort of gradually sliding this on a J stick and then lifting the J stick, gradually tilting it up and then dropping it into a socket kind of foundation. So, um, so there are so many words that one could think of. One could think of a number of other words. So um, I will stop here and hope that uh, you have some questions which you've been thinking about uh, for, um, for our practice, Nisha and me and uh, all the architects, um, um, especially um, Sana and Saika who are with us. Um, for all these um, details, um, it has to relate to the, the, the project and its imagination. And yet there is tremendous amount of possibility. So the assumption that a skirting is a skirting is a skirting is not true. Uh, a skirting can be different. Um, just the way any home is special or any other building is unique for its requirements. So, so that's where if we imagine everything as, a, as an opportunity of, of uh, empathizing with the, in, with the people for whom we design and we bring forth to life a project, um, I think it's a very, very um, satisfying process. So uh, thank you so much for your patience and I look forward to some of your questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, sir, for such an insightful and enthralling presentation. I would uh, now like to open the platform for any questions and answers that we have. Um, I think Yash has one question. Yash, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I had a question. Yeah. Uh, so how do you come up with a way of art articulation in many of your details? Is it a rational force that allows you to articulate in some sense or way, or is it a is it more of an artistic way of exploratory approach? Because uh, one one of your projects, uh, that house of two brothers, uh, there was this detail where you turned your connected. Uh, turned or connected the cable forming U or V. Uh, was it rational or was it an aesthetic? Sorry, which project, uh, yes? Which project? Uh, the, the, the project that was uh, uh, the exterior was, was white in color and uh, you said that there were, the bridge was connected in both of the houses. Uh, uh, the second project that you showed uh, where you installed fabrication uh, uh, columns and uh, ah, Okay, a, okay, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So which aspect you're talking about there? The, the, the V forming of the V cable. Ah. Uh, yeah. So, so I was asking that, was it rational or was it aesthetic more prior in it? And if it's an amalgamation of both, then what holds most prior to you? Uh, uh, rationality or aesthetics? So I, I, I think, of course, um, I think uh, very often, um, I think we imagine things as binaries, which is actually not is perhaps simplistic, uh, but what it does is it, it forces us to make a choice or almost sort of implies that one should make a choice that it's either this or that, and that these are uh, mutually independent. So I think in between is the space where one is processing uh, these, at least these two worlds, why I'm saying at least is that, that these are not the only two words. Um, so, um, so I think the, the, the biggest knowledge base um, is actually the history of technology and design. Um, and here I mean by design, not just architecture, but um, from ordinary vessels to uh, cloth 
to saris to everything everything that has is in is is a part of uh, the world of design and so if one is familiarizes and that's what i find very interesting that one when one studies history of technology one is actually to, able to see like when are the first detailed drawings really available they're actually around renaissance time mm. when real detailed drawings are actually available before making before that it is it is made by um, perhaps scratching on the stone or or it's it's precise it's not that good buildings have not been done before the renaissance but the process gets formalized and also it gets divided the job gets divided the 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 there is a is the master builder or or the creator who has an identity now and later during the industrial uh, movement it actually gets even more distanced <coughs> and um, industrial products come into the picture so this history of change which is change of economy is change uh, methods of production it's a diff it's evolution of technological means introduction of steel so these are things which are of immense interest to me and i think that helps me bridge uh, and seeing their correlation with ideas of design um, at these different times which uh, because i have seen um such complex drawings um uh, uh, from medieval european buildings which have actually been drawn after they have been you know uh, they didn't exist before but they have been drawn <clears throat> that is just incredible i mean can you imagine i was just thinking i mean I'm, these are opportunities when i get to think up think about something particular like when we were building with stone we had to imagine how one piece would lock into the other um and not allow water but when concrete came i think the most important thing became the surface because the surface everything became monolithic and one could do so on one hand one got a sense of freedom you know of kind of having a malleable material which behaves like stone after it solidifies um and on the other hand we lost the imagination of complex things uh when they were part of little things and little geometries and little uh <clears throat> little grooves little indents uh <clears throat> so um yeah i think history his 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 history has been one of my uh, um favorite uh, kind of areas of uh, and and of course uh, the philosophy of uh, which has evolved over time uh, in different cultures because that's how i try to understand um, uh, how the thought process and the living and design uh, found some partnership uh, which you know came about right thank you Yeah. Uh we have another question by Siddharth Singh. He asks that would you approach the cinnamon revitalization uh in the same way if you were to do it today? Uh thanks Siddharth for the question. Um imagining that it would been the same kind of had the same challenges as before for most of my buildings actually i i say no i would not do it the same way but in this case it may not be very different actually because here the here the um, interventions have been so controlled and deliberately controlled to um to be invisible that i would still do uh, i would still go in that direction i don't know if i would modify something maybe some detail not so sure um but no i i in this case i wouldn't really uh, if 
for most of the other projects yes i always um there is a rethink but not in this case because it is so little and it is uh, um it's only what is necessary that that's why i would say not too much yeah i would it might be very similar uh i think tushar also has a question so you can yes. ask good evening sir the most interesting part in the lecture was how yeah. you were using different methods of detailing uh, by hand sketch representation detailing both in sketchup and also in hand sketching method and how you are coming about it and the other thing was the 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 care of the the water how you were taking care of water flow in the building um, the question that i have for you is um, in terms of uh, effort uh, affordance and the disruption in the building in the in detailing for example in the architect's house uh, you designed that mechanical doorway so uh, how how did you uh, how was the affordance in the design thought of and in the disruption part especially in that school where you cladded the i section with a with a wood post so uh, like as an architect all of our buildings are like made it cannot be uh, changed repeatedly so uh, how how do you come up with details which can uh, uh, which can help in further in future uh, disruptions uh, yeah uh, what is the last word you mentioned further uh, disruptions you're saying disruptions yes like uh, if in for instance in the school the the cladding came after yeah. uh, maybe the client or someone has come up that yeah the yes. students may come into it so yeah so how do you take care of that uh, uh, in in the process of detailing uh, yeah so it's a good point and i um, it, honestly that's true you know um, the, uh, uh, once they it was done the school was still not open but uh, perhaps uh, in their other school maybe there in some room there was a pillar and they had this incident or something so i'm glad they brought it up i had actually proposed something else which was which was actually a softer material but uh, uh, which was uh, but it was synthetic uh, so which i'm glad they uh, didn't really uh, fall for that um but they did really like this because i think we got cheaper wood and uh, so i imagine that over time this polish will go away i don't want to see that polish uh, maybe it will be grubby with the children's hands um, and sometimes we'll have to you know take a scotch brite take some soap and wash it so i think yeah building should weather they should they should age they should really age um, um, they should be durable and yet Uh, like i showed those steps in the other building um there is enormous amount of grace in in that um because it's not decay it is actually a different it is actually something which is a natural part of engagement with human life and i think that's that has a different value so like we we when we see these uh, you know ads with um Uh, if we people see the farmers from rajasthan sitting in the sun with squinted eyes uh, and with deep crevices in the skin i think it's absolutely graceful um because it shows how life has weathered um you know the surface um and that actually forms uh, what we normally don't realize that these things have uh have have an impact on how we think and how we live or deal with other things um so if, if i understand it correctly uh, i i like the door when you spoke about the door um yes i think in that particular house it was a lot about really a lot about um her the clients um not just aspirations but the aspirations were actually something which 
uh, which were not describable, but one had to walk the path to achieve it. Um, so the needs were extremely at a, at a psychological level uh, of what the space should do when I inhabit. And I think that's something very different. Of course, that, that door is not the cheapest door. You know, um, the idea of the guillotine is, uh, is my idea of fun and uh, not hers. Um, that was my idea that if when I go in, I should feel that God this is coming down. Um, so I think these are, um, so it, it, that comes from a very different space. Um, yeah, so I think project really takes, um, yeah, it does take more time. It takes time and um, one has to delve into the pulse of, of what, uh, what one is dealing with and can add to the narrative. So I think here, uh, the bigger question which comes is uh, where I do not have a signature. I refuse to have a signature. I do have a way of doing things, but I would say that um, to dilute any presence of ego um, is to have the humility to deal with what one is trying to do um, and let it flow in that direction. So that's how the details would emerge. Thank you. Yeah, I think Korean also has a question. So he would go next. Yeah, uh, hello, good evening, sir. Uh, so this was regarding the house uh, and, the, and the foothills that you were that you presented. Um, so so I could uh, see the room. Your mic is too loud. Uh, uh, Korean, your, you could you uh, be a little behind uh, back? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you repeat, please? Yes, sir. Yeah. So so I was talking about uh, the house in the foothills that you presented. Uh, so, so I could see uh, the treatment of the roof. So, so it was a metal roof from the outside, and the inner space was more of plastered. So, um, a soffited uh, a kind of uh, walls that kind of merge with the roof. So, I was, uh, you know, I was thinking if when the when the material changed from the outside to the inside, uh, uh, was there a consideration of of the you know plaster developing cracks or something because of the metal you know behaving in differently because of contraction and expansion? So, how did you kind of deal with that? Uh, you know, a different material behavior from the inside and the outside. Yeah. Uh, good question, Korean. This is how it works. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, no, work out the detail, how it sort of, you know, uh, comes down from, uh, or let's say the masonry wall goes up till 2.4 meters. And uh, from there, it touches another material and the detail was tested. Um, really being that, uh, I mean, it proved successful, but of course, one has not seen it for you know, more than two, three months. Um, and it is a kind of a modification of a traditional technique. So um, question is absolutely valid. This was the challenge, yes. On the underside, it is not metal, it is plywood. It is not metal. Uh, on the underside, it's uh, ply with steel sections uh, in between and insulation. And um, top is again plywood uh, and then the hand done metal roof and uh, you know the drip um, yeah so this only time will tell i think we have do done the best we could uh, and also tested it now we have to only hope for the best right sir yeah so one more question regarding uh, regarding the architect's house so you you mentioned that you treated the uh, skirting with the zinc uh, metal so uh, so the fixing of the zinc metal and I'm supposing the walls were, uh, you know, concrete. So, um, so the fixing of the metal to the concrete. So was it considered uh, preemptively while casting or how, uh, you know, the, the dowels were left, um, you know, beforehand or how was the fixing done? It was an adhesive I will, or... I will do. Yeah. I will just go to the detail. I'll just share the screen that might yeah. make it easier. Yeah. Uh, a 
otherwise there will be no reference Yeah, the left um, drawing that you see. Uh, yes, you can okay. see the drawing on the left. Yeah. So what's happening is uh, mm, can I annotate on this? I can't. Right. <laughs> Okay, doesn't matter. So what you see, um, the edge, which is like a stainless steel edge, number six, and there is a rod which fixes it to the uh, concrete below. So it gives the edge to the flooring. And then what, and this notch was created in the concrete beforehand. Then a leveling plaster was done at the bottom of the groove. And then if you see the zinc closely, they have all been, both the ends are folded, you know, they are rolled over. Yeah, so. Yeah. When you do that, it sort of pushes like you push your arms out, you know, and then mm -hmm. just to keep it secure, there is uh, there is also a bit of glue that is uh, uh, which is used here. Uh, and see, you can get only a certain running length of, uh, of uh, metal sheet. So once you've done one channel, uh, let's say a certain length, then you need a grip. So then you kind of lock it like this, you know? So, it, and, and since the building is bending in different directions, in different angles, literally everything gets locked. Okay, 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 right. If it was, uh, you know, um, if it was rectangular, then perhaps it would lock only at the corner, you know, as a, as a kind of right angle uh, point where it would sort of lock into each other. Right, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Kurian. Yeah. Kazal, I think that uh, it seems we are crossing seven. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can take another 10-15 yeah. minutes, but I'll just intervene here for the uh, sake of at least some of you to ask this question, uh, which perhaps maybe uh, you may be thinking about it. One that uh, uh, there are particular types of uh, selection of the project. There are projects in which there are frame structure and the steel is inserted in it. There are structures in which it's a mass structure and the steel is inserted in it. Or there are also cases in which the steel is layered over the mass structure. These are three, four kinds of, 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 of materiality or tectonics that has been uh, at least shown, uh, Swamitra, in this uh, presentation. Uh, yeah. From a point of view of right. a time student, uh, one would be very curious to understand uh, the approach to detailing because, because if I look at it, uh, uh, there are various cases in which one could see mechanical joints, like the doors or, or other kinds of fixing. But there are also a lot of cases like the last detail where there are a lot of adhesiveness, that, yeah. adhesive that has been used in metal. Okay, and and therefore one is uh, one would be trying to see uh, one would be seeing a particular way in which detailing is happening, that that even if you have got a if you have, let's say if you are doing a uh, sort of a coping, then then you are sort of layering it with metal and trying to sort of develop over a over a mass structure etc. So, so 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 one that's one would be interested in this whole approach to detailing. Okay, that is one kind of a question which which as a, as a student of architecture many of us would be interested to know what is that what is it that is going on the second is that how it begins mm -hmm. that's what's one of the most difficult point from a perspective de detailing to give you a concrete example many of the sketches that you have put in are all the sketches of the part and 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 how the parts are coming together so you're sketching the box section you're sketching the angle fixed to the box now when i scale up to the next level because for the sake of students it is important to know uh, what is this jump how do you jump from one to the other and then again come back because that would be one of the design struggle 
where where the idea of the space uh, and the idea of the tectonics converge and that convergence are very difficult sometimes to negotiate and somebody at least uh, who has uh, so since last 20 25 years investigated into into this area of coming together i would say that if you can put some pointers there then then at least from 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 a point of view of some of the students for all of us it would be important to sort of uh, get a sense of it and then i think couple of questions we can more take gazal before we close the session but i think it it seems that this i was compelled to ask this question so sorry for that yeah thank you uh, thank you sankalp for uh, really putting it a uh, good perspective to it you know because it's a very important question um Uh, 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 I mean, so uh, firstly, I think what I've been trying to understand why, you know, why concrete uh, came uh, firstly a kind of a tool and a material which would represent uh, integrity um, or a materials in their raw uh, sorry my lights have gone off so <laughs> bear with me um um if uh, when uh, 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 when architects talk about whether it was khan talking about brick or corbusier working with concrete and various other people <coughs> what was this obsession um in some ways it's it's seen as a kind of uh that material process surface has to talk about the idea of uh honesty truth so I, for me this actually comes from um somehow from a religious background it is it it does not come out of the blue uh but it moves its out as a value which uh people tried to um to bring back into their work um of course there is argument that concrete was easier to do it was faster to do and it was post the war uh things like that um sorry i'll use the phone maybe so um so about material and different kinds of materials uh of uh, uh, uh coming together uh, now and there is uh, there is obviously a strong chance of uh having unforeseen failures or uh you know because it has not been tested adequately and as we all know that concrete buildings are not that old in history and uh, enough have issues with them uh and they are not the easiest to repair either so this um this movement of uh, as a kind of uh integrated into um frame structures uh, or also even with masonry structures is a certain amount of risk uh, uh but it also has certain amount of uh contrast in footprint in the possibilities of uh a modified or a different kind of space so i see this as an opportunity and yes of course the challenge is really on the outside where weathering and aging is good but deterioration is bad i mean that's very clear uh, deterioration should not happen uh, it, one one is happy with aging that's that's okay so um so this aesthetic which which actually bridges uh, between you know one uh, way of doing it with other materials 
is something which is also to do with cities because uh, uh, like one building which I'm doing now is completely a steel building. It's completely steel. There is no space. Uh, uh, it, it's it's too intense to get too much material into the in the site. It has very few columns, um, uh, so the structural needs itself are very demanding uh, for large floor plate with a column-free space. So uh, a lot of so it's trying to find a balance actually between um, very pragmatic needs. Uh, needs related to planning of work um, and finding a way uh, from within that an aesthetic uh, to find a balance every time. So I think that's where it's all coming from. Uh, it's beginning from um, certain, from a certain narrative, which is project related a certain reality which is again project related and place related so i think from that then it becomes a negotiated condition that's what is happening as i see it i think uh arvind uh Hello. Hello. Hi, Arvind. Yeah, hello, sir. Uh, my question is that yeah, Arvind. in the first project, Cinnamon Boutique, you had, uh, you know, uh, like inserted a structure to protect the old one. In new projects, you're able to prototype and, you know, process these models, which would, uh, you know, with which you can understand the behavior. But in cases of these kind of dilapidated and, you know, kind of very weak structures, how do you, like, kind of arrive at, how do you anticipate the behavior of the addition? This is what my question is. So, yeah, I think in some ways that's, you know, trying to feel the nerve of an old building uh, uh, about its uh, aches and pains and pain points. Um, because I remember during the construction, there was, um, I was there in one of the rooms, a small room, uh, a previous night there was rain. And um, so I did see that there were some roots which were exposed through the wall. And so uh, I left at about 9.15 and I was driving back. And then I got a call at 9.30 minutes after I had left. That little room roof had collapsed with a part of the wall. That's one of the pictures that you had seen um, where the roots were showing. So, uh, yeah, so I think for such a building, it becomes very critical to really understand it as a, as a body, but also I think the spirit of it. So I'm sure when you saw the plan of that building, it, um, you would have realized how similar it is to uh, the Chetinard houses. And it's not surprising because uh, they are actually Chet Chetiards who uh, run the trust. Uh, they were trading between, you know, uh, between now Tamil Nadu and it was all Madras state. <clears throat> uh, um, earlier that side and uh, we had the Mysore Maharaja. So, um, at um, this point of uh, one realizes that when they built it, it already had some roots to what they were build their hometown, you know? So there is a pattern. So there is a personality to the whole thing. So they were building it like their homes for the orphanage. Um, so in, in some sense, which seems fantastic because it's like taking typology of a home to an orphanage, which is great, you know, as a, as a metaphor. Um, so I think that's what we have to, um, we have to not only uh, understand the body, but we have to also understand uh, the spirit and intent uh, which lies underneath. So 
sorry i'm not if i was able to answer you um, adequately i hope a little bit yes sir thank you thank you ankalpa can we go for one last question yeah i think we'll take this last question and then we'll end it yeah um so there's this question by jashash who says that while thinking of a detail at what stage of designing does the role and implementation of material comes into play does it affect any changes afterwards okay so i th i pretty much comes um at the early stage uh material because material is related to ability to what skill is required for it uh what cost it has um and what process it has to go through uh you know in terms of other components coming together how durable it will be um so i think it comes pretty early um and perhaps the dilemma at that point is what material you know uh, like which material one should actually use uh, and of course once that choice is made for the larger reason of let's say the um, of the narrative of the project and its appropriateness to that narrative uh and it's finding a language detail uh then its existence and uh layering connection to other uh, materials will then make it one complete story so material does come very early does come extremely early yes uh, a critical factor because it's like a cascade so um of course not always saying that i doubt it is entirely a kind of a a logic uh, a logic driven process but it is a very important aspect yeah because the logic is thinking about durability about performance about skills available is extremely important uh i think we have done and now let me invite karishma for the vote of thanks on behalf of sept university department of architecture we would like to thank you for an extremely informative presentation the talk shows the possibilities that is inherited in the expression of detailing to create a space which is poetic in terms of quality light form and contrast of materials the works puts forth the significance of articulation in every minute detail of space the projects also suggest a requisite usage of light as a detailing aspect to emphasize the different stages in the journey of an edifice from the variety of projects presented we could understand that the design and detailing go hand in hand and we could and it could be initiated from the initial conceptual development through sketches and models it was an insightful session and the knowledge we have gained will be highly valuable we would also like to thank sankalpa for organizing this street talk series and all of you for your active participation thank you thank you thank all you. thank you sankalp and uh, thank you all for being there uh, i hope we can all meet again yeah see you next time in campus <laughs> yes okay. thanks a take lot take care all stay well thank yeah, you thanks. bye bye bye